Hey everybody, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have seven ENFJs and I'll let them introduce themselves. Rebecca, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Certainly, hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Pebble. I am a YouTuber, so you can find me at Rebecca Pebble. I am obviously an ENFJ, but also an Enneagram 4, Wing 3, a little bit debatable, some think I'm a 2, we'll see. Uh, I've been into typology since I'd say college, and then I sort of, um, I'm sort of an armchair psychologist because I just study on my own. I don't have any formal training. Awesome. Megan? Hi, um, my name is Megan. I'm an ENFJ, and I'm also a two-wing three on the Enneagram, a uh, sexual social instinct. Um, I've been into type since... I think like 2012 now, like I was graduating college and kind of had an existential crisis because I was going to go into music. And then like, I kind of was like, wait, what else am I good at? Like, who am I? And so that kind of took me down the rabbit hole that I have not gotten away from ever since. I, I'm also on YouTube. I have a podcast called Synchronic Saturdays where I talk about cognitive functions. I'm just super, super nerdy about this stuff. So you could uh, find me there. But yeah, I mean, I, I I actually, I am studying organizational psychology and I'm like interested in a, a lot of Jungian stuff and I'm kind of just seeing where that takes me. So I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you. And Denzel? Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Denzel Mensa. Um, I'm an ENFJ, nine wing one, social sexual. And I'm also on YouTube. Um, I got into type... I believe in 2014, um, I was introduced to it by um, my now wife and um, best friend, Jamila and David, um, ISFP and INFJ. And ever since then, like I just really liked the idea of better getting to know myself and know other people and then helping them become the best versions of themselves as I do the same with, my, with myself. So now um, my profession is life coaching and um, relationship coaching. Um, and I'm hoping to one day bring that into uh, t- uh, coaching a lot of actors and actresses so they can, you know, teach us throughout their movies and shows and all of that, like, in ways that we'd be able to relate to them. Awesome. Great information. And Leanne? Hi, I'm Leanne, and I um, got involved in type probably about 10 years ago. Um, I think I just took the test and I've been very active in personality typology forums. And then probably about three years ago, I decided to get um, MBTI certified. Um, And so I kind of, I started my own typing business, personalityblocks.com. And then I'm also in school right now for clinical mental health counseling. So I hope to integrate um, typology and personality type into um, helping others. And I am an Enneagram 2 wing one Very cool. And Stephanie? So I'm Stephanie. I'm a sexual five, I believe. Um, I got into MBTI back in possibly 2013 or so, but I've always been into um psychology and and understanding myself better through different lenses whether it be astrology human design um mbti enneagram um i actually have been following personality hacker for a while and i met denzel at um, one of their events last year and i i'm a teacher and i i actually really enjoy using mbti whenever possible uh, with my students to understand them better and tailor a lesson. I wish I was in one of your classes. So it's pronounced Rivka. So my name is Ophira. I only, Rivka is my middle name. Uh, I'm like semi-anonymously playing around with Twitter, kind of figuring out how I want to put myself out there. Uh, For sure. You guys, you guys can call me whatever you want, uh, Rivka or Ophira. Uh, okay. I'm, I don't know Enneagram as well, but I think I might be a four, maybe a social four. I really, I relate to the problems of that type. 
Uh, I got into MBTI in uh, high school. I had uh, an INTJ and an ENTP friend, and we decided I was an ESFP because extroverted feeling was like this evil demonic function. It was like the person who like forces you to arrange your utensils properly next to a place, or like you can't possibly be that. Uh, I was a radio person previously. Uh, I'm in a period of recuperation right now. Megan, it's cool that you said that you study IO psychology because that's one of the career paths I'm actually looking at. Yeah, I was gonna pick oh, cool. IO psychology too. <laughs> and Vicky? Hi, I'm Vicky. Um, I'm an ENFJ and um, according to Joyce, I am <laughs> Enneagram three wing two. Um, how I got into it was that a few years ago, one of my friends was writing a book and she had a character in mind. She's way into, she knows way more about typology than I do. And she was writing a book and one of the characters, she wanted it to be an ENFJ. And so she thought I was an ENFJ. So she made me pick a test like several times in front of her just to make sure that when she writes her character in the book, it's going to be based off me. And I got ENFJ every single time. <laughs> so, um, and then Joyce confirmed that I'm an ENFJ. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then also um, what I do is I have two businesses. One is in Japan and one is here in the US. They're two completely different industries. Um, yeah. Yeah, wow. Vicky, your two businesses reminds me of Megan Lovoda and how she works so hard with her multiple businesses too. Yeah. And yeah. a topic that Megan wanted to bring up was burnout, and we will go into that soon. <laughs> and, and so my name is Joyce. I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, and I have facilitated the MBTI in some organizations. And so let's get to it. So the first topic of discussion, burnout. What are your experiences with burnout? I feel it every day. <laughs> um, I think for as long as I, like, as long as I can remember and as long as everyone has known me, I'm always doing too much. Um, I think at this point, like I've know, I've learned how to be better at saying no, but at the same time, it's kind of hard because if I made a commitment, I can't just not do it. So I end up killing myself over it, like not sleeping, uh, whatever it takes in order to make sure I keep my word. Yeah, and I just want to pop it and say the reason why I even brought that up as like a potential topic is because whenever we all like got in here everyone was like how is it, how are you how are you doing and I was like good but in my mind I'm thinking like actually I'm freaking exhausted because that's what I do I relate to what you were just saying Vicky and I, I've really just been reflecting the past couple days in particular about how like the pace that I try and go down is like so not realistic like physically because my ideas come to me so much faster than like what I'm physically able to do. And I feel like I keep learning the same lesson time and time again, like slow down, like go easy on yourself. But like, it's easy. It's, it's easier said than done. It's easier to give a friend that advice and it's easier to like grasp the idea of it than it is to actually like rest and like do it. <laughs> so self love is a problem for me. <laughs> It's, it's something I need to learn. Even just like Joyce, you mentioned once that like, you can think of ideas, no problem, but like the day to day stuff is, is not, not as intuitive. <laughs> That's exactly it. Burnout, I think, especially as a social nine, I, that landed me so hard with Beatrice Chestnut's um, descriptions where they're like, they work so overly hard for whatever group that they're involved in and everything and then it's kind of like it's like they become like a workaholic for the group it's like oh i i, I want to be included i want to be included and so you do all of this stuff but it it becomes burnout when you find that the group that you're involved in you're not really as uh you're not really as connected with the people involved as you thought that you were and so then it becomes like, oh man, like I'm doing all of this stuff, not because they, not because uh, I want them to like me, but because I liked them so much. But then when you find out that you're not even really like that close with them, then it's like, dang, like I'm overextending over here. 
but for what? Like I'm just throwing all of this into quicksand in a way. And so what I've actually been doing, cause I used to have like heavy burnout and what I've actually been doing like for the past two years, but especially this year, um, my one and only like New Year's resolution, which I think that Joyce and Stephanie and I have talked about a lot is this strong concept about like seeds and um, knowing that I'm a limited source of water and therefore I extend my energy only in places where I'm, I'm sure that like, you know, I've watered the seeds that I know I'm gonna bear fruit from. That way um, I can still always have like energy left over. Um, I also do a practice in the morning where uh, I'll wake up like before my, my alarm clock, before the time I'm supposed to be awake. So I'll sacrifice sleep like 45 minutes to an hour every morning. <laughs> um, and I'll just sit there and stare at my fan like the ceiling fan, I'll just sit there and I'll stare at it. And during that time, like I, I view it as my personal type of meditation. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll just be on my phone. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's spent like, you know, in prayer. Um, and sometimes I really actually just close my eyes and I'm just laying there in silence. I do this also a lot of times at night, although at night it get, that's where it gets hazy because then I actually fall asleep. But I found personally that that's been helping a lot for me uh, to actually manage my energy. Cause even though I sacrificed that 45 minutes to an hour of sleep, um, that energy that I could have gotten from the sleep instead, the energy I got before from the, the previous sleep or whatever is now extended throughout the day a lot longer, like it lasts longer. And then now I've been doing a lot better with where I put my energy in relationships and friendships, um, because I have them like categorized in a way, like I have the intimates and then I have the front, the best friends and I have the friends and I have acquaintances, stuff like that. And I know like to make sure that my intimates are watered first before I go out to my um, best friends and then stuff like that. And I see like which flowers need more cultivating my garden in that way. So yeah, but before that burnout for me was horrible, absolutely horrible. <laughs> Cool, Denzel. And, and so what you said made me think about how you talked about you want your intimate close circle to know that they're close to you. Like it's very important for you, like that the people close to you know where they stand with you yeah. and you make an effort to show that. Absolutely. And that's what, what you said reminded me of. <laughs> Denzel, oh, I also want to acknowledge, I have like nerves talking on camera. I can feel like my cheeks trembling sometimes or... <laughs> You YouTubers are probably used to this, but this is a, this is a new experience for me. Uh, it's Denzel, definitely weird at first. <laughs> it's also, I guess, easier because I'm like in company of great ENFJs. So it's like, I mean, I've already been on a video before with Megan and Joyce. So now it's like, you know, if this was like the first time that I was on with Megan, then that'd actually be a big deal. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like yeah. okay, you know, so I've had mm -hmm. to like warm up to that. <laughs> yeah, being in a group of ENFJs is like medicinal, you know, chicken soup for the soul. <laughs> yeah, I just noticed though it's like almost kind of weird because nobody wants to talk over each other, and we all want to like respect what the other is saying. That like I feel like myself kind of hold held holding back just because yeah I don't know if you guys feel that yeah I spoke up before not because I was necessarily ready to but because there was like this space I was like oh I want to help the group by doing this and I was like oh no why have I done this uh but now I have a real response Denzel uh you brought up something for me I read a while back uh somebody said that they defined burnout as seeing problems in the community and not necessarily being able to do anything about it and that was huge for me. Uh, this person has just become a founder recently, so they're finding a lot more joy in their work now by actually being able to address things. Uh, and Joyce, you and I have talked a lot about like finding the right community and fitting in and like not just trying to like be a part of a community for the sake of being part of a community. Uh, so in, in recent times, I've really kind of changed how I define community in terms of what is healthy for me. Yeah, that's really good, that's real. Um, that's actually something that I'm going to sit down and process for a while, but that's so true. Cause yeah, like you, if you, if you don't have the energy to solve the problems that you view, then it's like, 
I mean, like, what's the point? You know, like if you if you burn yourself out today, then it doesn't um, if you if you're able to get through today, but you don't have energy for tomorrow, then like, yeah, what's the point? So, yeah, it's really good to learn how to manage your energy so that the next day um, you can have more energy to continue to move forward. And obviously the world needs us. There's only but so much of us. <laughs> so it's a good conversation. Yeah, yeah, that was magnificent. R Rivka, it, it made me think about how like ENFJs make great spiritual coaches or mentors or leaders. <laughs> like I, I felt like I learned something about my own soul by listening to you. <laughs> and so Stephanie and Leanne. Um, yeah, I, I've definitely experienced my share of burnout, um, especially with work, both at the workplace and at home. Um, as well as relationships. Um, I can just get into the zone where I, I just want to complete everything and check everything off my checklist. And it's really difficult to pause and I can ignore hunger cues and, and bathroom cues and just keep going. Um, and and I, I may not feel it right away. It may take a couple of days, but eventually it'll hit me hard and I just start becoming not as nice of a person. Um, I, I think with relationships, I've been a little bit more discerning, maybe because I'm a five, but but when I get really invested in, in someone, whether it's a friendship or a, a romantic relationship, it, it can be really difficult to, to know where like where I end and they begin, like those boundaries get really hazy and it's again, easy to just give and give and give and um, yeah. and neglect all of my physical needs. So the last, I go through phases um, and the last few months I've been getting really good at, at being on top of like uh, what Rivka mentioned, self-love, uh, self-care, but, but just giving myself, um, physically and mentally and spiritually, like what I need to feel full and taken care of so that I can then put all of that energy out there, whether it's at work, um, doing things around the house or in my closest relationships. So it's really important to, to give to yourself first so that you can replenish yourself so that you can give from that place. Um, that's, that's what I found has worked best for me, finding that balance. So yeah, Stephanie, totally agree. You make a good point about how like when an ENFJ is like maybe overstressed, they might get into the grip of their TI and say like a little, like maybe a little bit harsher than they would normally because like the FE filter starts to get a little thinner. <laughs> and yeah. I realize that it's like when we're out of energy, then that means that we have to be quicker about how do you get your words out to not waste someone's time or your time. Like when you have less energy to do something, then you have to like, I, I don't know, like I, I think that our inferior TI has a hard time with it. I've been realizing because like sometimes I, I'll have to like say to friends or something like, I'm not trying to sound short. I just only have five minutes right now or something like that. It's like well, sometimes it's like you have to take out some of the FE niceties or like it's hard for us to even like put the blocks together to like, figure out like, I have so much to do, but I only have 10 minutes. So like, I think that's partially why we could be that way. Cause it's hard for us to figure out a solution. I wanted to piggyback and say, I do that all the time, especially with text messages. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and it just sounds real choppy and it sounds like I'm angry. And, but I don't have time. Like you said, for the FE niceties that I normally love to give and do, it's like, I just got to get this out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to know that that's a TI thing, I was wondering. And um, I wanted to say too, with burnout, um, Denzel, it was really poignant when you were saying planting the seeds and it bearing fruit, because I think for me recently, it's been a burnout of creativity where I feel, and content creation, where I feel like I'm blasting everyone with everything I got <laughs> and I'm getting nothing back. And so I started to feel like, what's the point? Why am I, why do I put my art out there it's sort of like a tree falling in the forest and nobody's hearing it. Um, so that's where my burnout is coming from lately, feeling like that's not bearing fruit and it's frustrating. 
Yeah, that's that's a really big thing for me. Like, because with the seed thing, like I, I put that in everything that I think about now, but especially with, like with relationships and it's like, okay, so which of my relationships and friends and all of that give me fruit, you know, and how quickly will this come? You know, like, because it's energy to water these um, relationships. But if I know that as I'm watering this, then I'm gonna receive fruit back, then like the energy is replenished plus more depending on the type of tree that I have. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, and the same with yours, it, it, with creative pursuits and all of that, like, yeah, like everything is like, okay, I'm gonna be on this phone, like, or I'm gonna be working on this project. Like, how much am I gonna get from this? How much energy is it gonna take from me? And then how much is it gonna replenish for me kind of thing? Um, and that, like being mindful of that, really helps like so much. Like I was I was with an ESFP um, the other day or a few weeks ago actually. Um, and we were in a, we were with um, coworkers and she looked to me like while we were just like hanging out or whatever, she was like, I know I'm like an, a, like an extroverted person or whatever, but my social battery just went dead. And like, she pretty much was like trying to imply, I'm glad that she said that she knows that she's an extroverted person because she definitely is. <laughs> but she was like trying to imply like, you know, like oh, I just get drained so fast kind of thing. And I definitely believe like there definitely are people like who get drained like really quickly. Mm -hmm. But um, that idea of like knowing like the fruit that you're gonna get back and like knowing when to exert energy so that you can extend it throughout the whole day, kind of like a marathon of some sort. You don't just sprint at the beginning, but you kind of like pace yourself so that by the end, then you have a little bit left to sprint, which you can see that as like a full day. Um, I feel like thinking about stuff in that way, like whether it's projects or friendships or whatever it might be, um, that, that's been proven to be like really helpful for me. So what you said makes sense, Rebecca. Yes, Rebecca, good point. It reminded me about like when you said that an ENFJ will do something for someone, but sometimes it feels like a tree falling in a forest and no one hears and like there's no fruit from it. And what that can cause in like, especially ENFJ females I've seen is like low self-esteem issues. Like they'll give and give and give and the other person won't really like, they won't really like reciprocate. And after a while, the ENFJ might take it personally in the sense that like, oh, is it me? Is it like, or like, and then, yeah, it can cause the, this spiral that I've seen in my ENFJ friends. And then what will happen is because of inferior TI with ENFJ females, apparent, like mostly is that they'll talk to me about it. So they'll, they'll vent to see if what they did was okay. So something about TI inferior is that they'll talk to people to figure out what they think, especially for the females. Like, it's like uh, Megan, a lot of times like when she's figuring out something she'll discuss with me or like with someone about it to like talk it out and understand it more and i i really like that about her it's really fun to talk to megan she's a really cool person <laughs> and yeah i do that all the time my infj partner sometimes is even like why are you like you already know what you think why are you talking to me about it like don't listen to me and i'm like well i'm not it's not like i'm gonna listen to what someone tells me to do but like it really does help to verbally process like i feel like it comes off way more like i'm wanting someone to feed me the answer than how it really feels like from my experience i don't know if you guys relate to that <laughs> that's a good point oh definitely i want to agree with you megan i think just something about outwardly processing things. I can't, I get so trapped in my head, my goodness. It's like, I have so many things. Like Stephanie was saying, having that to-do list and you feel the sense of urgency, I have to check it all off. I thought that was just me. Maybe that's an ENFJ thing. I just get to this like hyper vigilant, it must all be done now kind of feeling. It's insanity, it's too much. And so Leanne, what are your thoughts? <laughs> so funny because I kind of had like this feeling like we might have this conversation I don't know why because it mirrors my experience but I think that's also just because it mirrors the experience of so many ENFJs um, out there but yeah I mean I'm in work full-time and then I'm also going to school and have been doing a lot of accelerated courses and I was like feeling angry with myself today because I I was like wait I'm on vacation right now and I've literally been working like the past three days, I think working from home too, even though it's like great that I'm able to do that, it kind of has blurred the blurred the lines a little bit. So it's, it's a lot easier to just 
always be on your computer. So yeah, it's, just, it's very applicable to me. But also um, what Denzel said about uh, what he was saying about the reacting um, versus the strategizing the energy, obviously, I mean, that's so easy to fall into. And it, a lot of that has to do with, I think, um, not being in your and I not or not taking the time to get in touch with that and I and just being constantly in response mode. Because I definitely relate to that. When I am overwhelmed, I'm also in a creative, um, I'm marketing and design manager. And I, um, so they, my company always wants me to come up with these great ideas. Like they're like, Leanne, you're an idea person. So come up with the ideas. But like, in order to come up with those ideas, you need space. You need like the energy to strategize and hit that target. Because if not, then you're, you're reacting, you're, you're in SE mode, and then you're not going to be the optimal ENFJ that you are. That is such a good point. And yeah, in Denzel's language, I hear a lot of NI, like he talks about intentionalness and mindfulness. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I also work uh, like as a creative, I do marketing, but then also I'm going to school like on top of that. And then also do like the typing service, like one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I, I relate a lot to what you were saying because you really do have to make sure like your mind is sharp like for doing creative work. And I have also had that like experience of like, if you aren't sleeping enough, if you aren't reading right, eating right, if you aren't exercising, then like the creative ideas won't land nearly as well. And I've begun to notice patterns. What's helped me is like tracking things like that and then journaling how I feel, but then also tracking those habits. And then like, I think it's easier for like NI to see the pattern when it's like, oh, you always have a really rough time whenever you aren't working out or eating right or sleeping. But another point thing I wanted to say too is that um, I feel like ENFJs, like we could be very idealistic about our goals and then can be hard on ourselves when we don't reach them. And I feel like we know like intuitively that what you give is what you get back. But what I've been learning though, is that like, if we can't receive it, then we aren't going to get it back. Like we have to receive just as much as what we're giving. And so I feel like I, that was kind of like a light bulb thing I have, I, I had, but then it's like, okay, so how do I receive still working on that? <laughs> but like, it's just as important as giving. And I feel like a lot of ENFJs can relate to, you know, giving and then being like, well, what am I, what am I giving back? Like what Rebecca was saying, like you're pouring your whole self out in there, but then like, where is the fruit, you know? So sorry, that's there's a, a lot, but. <laughs> that's a really good point, Megan. Like ENFJs learning the lesson of receiving with like, I, I mostly have experience with ENH, ENFJ females and something that they have difficulty with is receiving things from other people. Like normally my ENFJ is like, I'll take care of myself and I'll take care of you. You don't have to take care of me. And what will happen is like, whenever they share something about themselves or like they, like whenever I can't help them, they kind of feel like they're a burden to me, but they're not, but they'll assume that. And they'll go like, no, 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 no Joyce, I'll, I'll do it. I, I saw one of Denzel's videos and he talked about the term emotional pivot and like ENFJs, when you start to talk about their feelings, they'll like emotionally pivot maybe back to you sometimes if they feel guilty for talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. What are your strengths as a ENFJ and as you, as a person? <laughs> well, I'm thinking, I just wanted to point out that I literally, I just did the emotional pivot too. After I talk, I'm like, oh no, sorry for talking so long. What about you guys? But yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that Megan, personally, from what I've noticed from her, she impresses me because I've actually used her as an example of an ENFJ who does well, not emotionally pivoting. Like I've been cutting up some of our old discussions and I've been like posting because when me and Megan have done videos, they've gone like long discussions and everything. So I've tried to make them like shorter. And one of the things I'm constantly reminded of is how vulnerable Megan is. Like she has like little to no problem, or at least it seems like it from the outside just sharing herself and yeah she might feel like oh, i'm sorry like did i say too much but with the emotional pivot it's more like these enfjs don't even share period and i think i talked to leanne about that i actually mentioned her in the video before i uh posted it um the nuanced nudity video 
where um <clears throat> so the emotional pivot was like in response to Carolyn Zakowski, I think was her name. Uh where she she talked about like ENFJs, like when a uh someone puts them on the spot in a way and they haven't rehearsed or something and ask is asking them to like be like vulnerable or something, then they will somehow finesse and not really answer the question. And then they'll bring the attention on everybody else. So they want everybody else to be vulnerable, but they themselves won't be. And I remember me and Leanne, like she was one of the first people I talked to about that. And then Leanne said like, yeah, like this is annoys me about like ENFJs, um, how we do that and all of that. And that made me think, I was like, wow, well, yeah, that's true. But then that's when I made the nuanced nudity video where pretty much I was like, but the thing is you have to be careful with who you're showing your naked body to because the same naked body um, could disgust people or it could arouse people. And so you have to be able to like gauge that. And so the reason why ENFJs have this emotional pivot from my experience is because we, we know that if you show us your naked body figuratively, we're not gonna be disgusted by it, but we can't trust that from the other person. So until we can trust that from you, then no, we're not gonna show you ours. <laughs> um, but when we can see that, then it's like, yeah, we want to show you our naked body. So with Megan, yeah. I actually say that she's she does well, like from I just, most of the ENFJ that I know, like she's like, you know, like she'll show everything. And then- I guess like, I just wanna say that, I don't think I am though. I'm still hiding. Like, well, I, I was I was gonna say two things to that, but then I want I I appreciate if that is a compliment. I appreciate that you saying that because I do try and do that more. But two things is that it might have to do with being a sexual dom in the enneagram. Not sure, but I do think some of it is practice. Like if you're thinking of oh, am I sharing this? I think going to journalism school has helped with like sort of like a sound bite of, of like saying like saying something that I think someone might be interested in, like bringing just enough of myself out that would be intriguing. Like I feel like I've had to practice as far as like communicating. I feel like learning how to say that in a concise way and just being vulnerable is definitely something I've worked on. Well, um, I would say just in addition to all of that and tying it back to Joyce's question. Um, I think that is strength that ENFJs have. Um, we are very good and everybody kind of like tweets about it, you know, um, not, but like, I think that ENFJs really do take the cake for like getting people to open up and share things about them, like share, share things about themselves. And like, you know, there's that meme, like, you know, I don't always meet an ENFJ, but when I do, I tell them my life story, you know, and it's like, we just somehow, even without trying, like people will just walk up to us and just start spilling everything. And it's like, we have this aura about us, I guess, that allows people to feel welcome to do that um, and not regret it afterwards. So I think that that's a strength that we create that space for people to be able to be vulnerable. Um, and I think that another strength is, um, again, me and Leanne had talked about this um, once. I feel like we, in a way create culture or like we, we set the standards for society because a lot of times when you hear about like FE doms, especially it's like, oh, you know, they're the conformists and stuff like that. But personally, I think that as ENFJs, we're always looking ahead. So we're always like, we're never really satisfied. I mean, like we're, we're like happy with how things are in society right now, but we're never satisfied with it. So by the time the people the, by the time the society catches up with where we were thinking about, we're already thinking about like the next best way, the next three levels ahead of like how society should look like. And we're like, all right, well, I had that dream like, you know, 10 years ago. Now, now my dream is this for society. And then when we finally have that, then it's like, okay, well now my dream is this. So we're always trying to like improve that. And I think that we do the same thing like with relationships. Um, because FE is so focused, you know, like it is about like, you know, meeting people's needs. But I think that for me, especially what I've noticed is that FE is so focused on interpersonal connection. And maybe it's also because I'm social dom, but understanding the connection between everyone and then understanding kind of like with TE, like what things mess up a dynamic 
and what things can fix a dynamic. So ever since I was a child, you know, like I watch those corny like family shows and I still do. Um, I was just watching Family Matters, like Steve Urkel and stuff. And like you register the stuff like the husband just yelled at his wife, like mm, he should have done that. He should have used a softer tone. He should have done this, you know, like, oh man, maybe if he didn't say it in this way, maybe if he used this word, that probably wouldn't have started that fight. That was unnecessary conflict, you know? And so once you start like registering all of these things, then now you become a great relationship coach because then it's like, let him speak first and then just get it all out. And then afterwards you can say your piece and we can come to an understanding. And to us, it's like common sense because we're FE dominant and we use NI, but like, you'll be surprised how many people like they don't register that. And so like, I think that's another gift that we bring to the world. Very true, Denzel. And a point to piggyback off of that. Yeah, ENFJs, they kind of know when something is like unnecessary harm in your relationships. Something and a strength of ENFJs is they, no matter what tradition is, they, if it's wrong, like it, for relationships and for humans, like they won't accept it. So it's like, a lot of people, you know, when there's an unhealthy family dynamic, they can numb themselves to it or desensitize themselves to it. But ENFJs, they're kind of like, this This is wrong because I know that it's wrong. Like, this is not the ideal of what it could be. And you guys are fighting and like, or you guys aren't doing what's best for mother or they, so they, ENFJs know when something is going wrong in a relationship, even when everyone else acts like there's no problem at all. And, and so they, they have a detector for how human bonds could be better. And they don't settle because they don't, they don't take the baseline of what other people tend to accept. They kind of create their own baseline or they want to create their own baseline for the healthiness of relationships. I'll jump in with um, some ENFJ strengths. So I think something that we're pretty good at that not all types I think can do is I feel like we have a bleeding heart for the misunderstood, the misfits, the outcasts. We can get along with, I think pretty much any type or anyone. I think we can sort of see them as a way maybe other people haven't seen them before, sort of beyond the skin, almost into their soul, as intense as that sounds. Um, I think being able to really see people I notice sometimes people are a little shocked at how much I know already before <laughs> I really know somebody intuitively, just know them and give them grace and understanding that maybe other people wouldn't give them. One other thing is I think um, we can have an otherworldly charm or charisma too, I notice, sort of a magic. So for all of you ENFJs, don't forget you've got a little je ne sais quoi um, card in your deck that not everyone has. Yeah, I was gonna uh, just kind of piggyback off Rebe what Rebecca said, um, which is like a lot of times we just were able to anticipate people's needs. So um, I, this is kind of gonna bring up my point, which is I think our strength, like for me, I mean, I really feel like it's planning. Um, pretty much everyone like looks to me for planning, whether it's friends or family. Um, and it's just because like, I think I, I just know what people want. <laughs> so I'm, all, I'm always like, okay, like I'll plan it. And I'll, and also thinking ahead, um, I can figure out, I can plan something knowing in mind what it is that they need at the moment or what they want so that they could feel really good. Um, you know, like if it's for like birthday events or whatever it is. So I think planning um, just because we we tend to think so far in advance and also just knowing what um, what people want. I thought of a few strengths. Um, the <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was I'm really good at beating myself up. And then I, I thought like, no, Rivka, that's not that's not a real strength. <laughs> uh, but that that actually points to, I think, kind of a keenness, a sharpness. Uh, being other people have kind of touched on this, being able to perceive things that other people might ne not necessarily see or miss. And uh, Megan, Joyce, you guys both mentioned an interest in industrial and organizational psychology. And for people who don't know that what that is, uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, I only know a little bit. It's, uh, 
it's kind of like designing systems and structures and policies and procedures within organizations, but in a way that kind of like everyone can do their job in a sustainable way. People are getting like emotionally what they want out of it. People aren't getting too burnt out. And it's kind of moving all these different systems and levers to make to make the, the organization literally work as a healthy organism. That That's actually a really good metaphor. If the organism is kind of sick in one place, you'll see that kind of spread out to different spots. And it's, I feel like that that work is a lot of characterizing that problem and then kind of trying to find ways to improve it. And that's something that my mind does really naturally. I mentioned that I used to work in radio. I used to work a lot in not only volunteer management, that was kind of like, I thought it was almost a baseline way of doing my job. It was kind of like looking and saying, well, why is this, this so difficult? Why do I have to put so much of myself into this? What's going on here? and kind of redesigning all of the systems and structures uh, within the radio station so that, excuse me, everything could flow more naturally, volunteers could come and it could be more accessible. Accessibility, I think, is a very big strength of ours. Um, what else was I going to say? I got, I got into my thought and I lost, I lost my other strength. Uh, it'll come back to me. <laughs> I'd love though, Megan, to hear a bit more about your IOS. I actually was just going to say really quick, not about that, but just that that happens to me all the time where like a thought just like leaves me. And I've noticed that it seems to be pretty common for the NFJs. <laughs> and I feel like people don't think about it as happening to ENFJs as often as INFJs because we can like seem on, but I definitely relate to that. <laughs> I think that's when the SE just kicks in and you just improvise. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of like you're following a thought trail, like a bloodhound, and then somebody distracts the bloodhound, looks away, and then it's like, oh great, where'd it go? But now so, you just gotta <laughs> just gotta I actually just <laughs> have to say that I now force myself to take notes whenever I'm doing videos like these because I used to either interrupt or just like talk too much. And like, so I feel like if I don't take notes, I'm literally going to forget what I was just saying. So yeah. Yeah, and I feel like that can cause us anxiety or at least me personally. Like I'll be like, oh, that's why like, I feel like to stay organized, I literally have to write everything down on paper or somewhere. And then I can like, I can move past it. Like we were playing poker the other day, me and my family were playing poker and my dad, my dad, he's the ending dom. He just kept coming up with all these random rules, like for each round. And I was like, I can't strategize and have to remember these rules at the same time. So I write them down on the paper and then they stay there. It's like, I'll always remember, I can go back and check to make sure at the end, like that it doesn't, you know, to make sure that I'm on par, but I wouldn't have to cloud my mind with that, those details and then lose sight of my strategy. Yeah, I also do that with what people tell me. So I, I have like my planner, I have all my notes. Um, so when someone tells me something and I know there's certain details that I'm going to forget, um, but it's really important to that person. Like it could be something like, I don't know, something that's happening in their life and it's a, a huge, you know, there's a, a date. You know, so I would write that information down so that the next time I see them, I can bring it up or, you know, I could text them or, or something because I don't want to like just seem like I, I wasn't listening. <laughs> I do that with names like Michael Scott. And if you ever seen The Office, have you always had those associations? I like write them in my note app, like when I meet new people. I do that because otherwise, I just the name is like the one thing that I don't know if that's an SI. It, it's probably not just SI, but I would assume that SI people probably were stronger with that. But, you know, I'm sure some of you have noticed that like people, I don't get personal. I don't get personally offended. People don't remember my name, but I realized to some people that's a huge deal. Like it's, it, it's means that you're not like acknowledging their identity to some people. And so I find that really interesting and I've had to kind of learn how to accommodate when I worked in volunteer management, it was like it was offensive to forget someone's name because exactly like you said, a lot of people see that as a way of appreciating their work. Uh, thank you for those tricks. I have a I have a pen and paper, and because of these, I have remembered uh, what I was going to share. 
Uh, a strength of mine, uh, and I'll try to frame it as an ENFJ, is, uh, well, one of them is fashion. I really, fashion powers me. I really like it. Uh, and that's one, but not all of the reasons that I kind of relate to the Enneagram for. Uh, Megan, you made a post a while ago on Twitter about the strengths of the ENFJ, and you talked about creativity. And I saw that and I was like, hey, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And for me, like, I guess everyone interprets fashion a little differently. Uh, Susan Storm is actually, I heard like interviewing somebody who uses MBTI uh, in relation to fashion to give advice that way. And I think that's so interesting. Uh, for me, I think like it's a combination of like, I love playing with the symbolism inherent in things. Uh, Megan, I talked to you a little bit too about like just memes that are like inherent in different objects and stuff. And even like, I'll show you, I'm wearing this ring. I don't see if you can see it, like it has snakes and flowers on it. And it just like, it elicits like so many thoughts in people. And then you can kind of use FE to be like, okay, like who am I with? What are they thinking? How are they perceiving me? How can I play with that? And it's, for me, it's gotten to the point where it's like, it's literally play, I'm having fun doing it. Uh, so that's that's one skill. And then I wondered if anyone might relate to uh, social justice is an area where I find myself more and more active. Uh, <laughs> I sometimes like I, I guess I shame myself a lot like as a as an FB user because I can get like so TI intense and I guess the circles back to like that that sharpness that perceptiveness uh, and like seeing like you like you said Joyce kind of like sweeping things under the carpet is like okay until the carpet's so lumpy that people can't even walk on it so I'll often I'll bring up something and it's really uncomfortable but like to me we're getting ourselves to a better place and so it's worth it to do it that way. Yeah, I just was gonna say, I highly, highly relate to that. And even as what Denzel was saying earlier about how like for the ENFJ, it's different than kind of how it, an ESFJ might be where like we kind of are, won't feel satisfied with where we are because we're always pushing to somewhere else. And like, I only relate to feeling like sometimes you do have to say something that might be uncomfortable in order to grow as a community. And so I definitely have been that person. But I also think that the challenge for ENFJs and why I do think a lot of us do tend to be in like social justice and activism and nonprofit work is because we can tend to feel like we are carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders and that like we need to do, we need to save it and stuff. So that's something that I'm kind of trying to work on not feeling as much of like, oh, I need to save and more so like, what is my part in this? Or like, how can I just like be this individual? But I, I've noticed too that I can put standards on myself to where it's like, um, every, like I need to be like, the, be the change you wish to see in the world sort of thing where it's like, it's hard to cut myself slack, <laughs> but yeah. That's a really good point, Megan. It makes me think that like ENFJs take on a broad range of responsibility, social responsibility. It's like for changing things for the better. And that causes them to be into social justice or like like proactively wanting to do the right thing because they have a really broad range of the things that they 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 kind of organize and for for better social outcomes. Like so they feel responsible for better social outcomes. Yeah. yeah, I think also, <clears throat> I I think that for at least for me, I don't know if it's because I'm FE and also a nine, or if it's just the ENFJ thing or what, but we're really good from what I see is like just bringing both sides together. Um, and that's, I think, also what makes us like pretty good with like social justice, because from what I've noticed is like, whenever I feel myself become indignant about something, I'm like, okay, let my, my biggest weapon is understanding the other side, the opposing side. Why are they as indignant as they are? You know, I have to understand that so that I can actually communicate with them because just attacking them, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna fix things, you know, at least most of the time I feel, but if you can, find a way to reprogram the way that they think about something, the way they view something, then now they'll be able to see what you're seeing, especially if you've shown them that you've been to their side. Um, and maybe when you've been to their side, then you'll probably be like, oh shoot, they're right. So you always have to have that openness of like, okay, 
maybe I was on the wrong side after all. But sometimes both sides are wrong. Sometimes both sides are right. And sometimes, you know, you just like, it's like you have to find a middle ground um, or medium. And so uh, at least for me as an ENFJ um, and potentially as a nine, understanding the other side so deeply that I can then communicate and speak their language and explain like, this is why this is going on. This is why that's going on. I feel like that's a big thing. So like um, one of my videos, I wrote, I I made a video about um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And like, pretty much, I just called it like, you know, like my thoughts about racism. And I, I don't really ever appear to choose sides. Or if I do choose a side, I make sure the other side sees that I'm like hitting my people too. So like when I was like talking about like, you know, the Black Lives Matter stuff and everything, like, you know, I definitely address, you know, like what the opposing side, you know, would be. But then when I got over to my side, then I was like, yo, and like for us black people, you know, like I see this on Twitter a lot of times, like if you're talking about like, oh, we have the best skin color in this. No, that's not right. Like we, what might, what Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to get us to do is to have an even playing ground. So what, so yeah, we've been oppressed or whatever, but now's not the time to like one up the other races. Now's the time to try and get us to an even playing ground. So yeah, we're boosting ourselves up, but we're supposed to boost ourselves up till we're over here, not to like get up here and then push the others down. Cause then now they're going to be like, Hey, look at all the black people. And so like understanding why they're mad, but then also understanding and understanding what we're doing to them is like, yo guys, like, chill out. But then also being able to tell them like, but y'all also have to understand that we have been oppressed and blah, blah, blah. And not to like make this like a very like social justice kind of thing, but that's just like an example of like being able to understand both sides so that you can communicate and therefore show like, like not show partiality and bring things together in that way and mediate. Yeah, Denzel, I think one of the ENFJ strengths is meeting people where they're at. It's why they're so good at meeting needs. So it's like, you know, when Megan was wondering if she was speaking too much, because like FE is really good at knowing the reciprocal give and take. It's like, okay, I've given, so I just want to make sure the give and take is equal. So like ENFJ's superpower is like meeting people where they're at. It's why they're so like genuinely kind and caring, because if they're not meeting you where they're at, then they want to try harder to meet you where you're at. And and they that's why like they're so good with people. <laughs> and so Stephanie, what are your thoughts on this? Um actually I have to go soon. So I, I don't mean to I don't know if you have to go soon as well, but I sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt, but I didn't know if I could just answer the question before yeah. I leave. For sure. Yeah. Is that okay, Stephanie? Okay. So I, I just was going to say that Um, overall strengths, I would say like uh, passionate, empathetic, creative, big picture thinker, especially when I first like was looking at like the ENFJ description, those were things that really stuck out to me. But it's interesting, like the more I've been into type, the more I feel like I'm wanting to define myself by like traits that are me and not just an ENFJ thing and trying to separate the me from the ENFJ. Not that like other ENFJs won't relate, but like, it's almost like my TI is trying to get even more hyper specific (laughs) about me, you know? But like, I feel like one of my favorite things about myself is like um, having like a strong will, which I think a lot of ENFJs could relate to this. But I think for me, I, I feel like I've I've always been told by my like parents I have a good like head on my shoulders. I feel like I'm not like easily swayed like from my path once I do feel um like a sense of clarity about it. It could take a while to get to the clarity. But like that and also um I really um I I I think one of the ways that my inferior TI can come up is like being very clear like really caring about critical thinking and not wanting to half ask my thinking because I've been in situations where people have like half asked their thinking and it has caused like a lot of harm I mean like I've not to get too personal but like I've been verbally abused and, and gaslit so that's kind of like me being vulnerable as Denzel was saying I, I guess I'm proving your point here but I I've been on the other end of like 
you know, pathological lying, like just messy situations. Also like even politics, like I've seen how like misinformation can really harm things. So that's just like a passion of mine too, as I, as I improve. And I think, you know, having type as a tool to be like, oh, this is an area of weakness, like can help you kind of see like, oh, if I'm not naturally doing the thinking, I'm not naturally like coming up with my own view, like it's really is important to not, you know, forget um, to do the critical thinking because it really does hurt, hurt people as well. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely, it, that was really well said, Megan. And I, I feel like it also goes back to the point of wanting to meet people where they're at. Because um, when you have be bad TI logic, sometimes you're disrespecting where that person is at. And like the ENFJ wants to like, like ultimately honor, like meet people where they're at. And so the reason why like, uh, like it, what it can do is it can cause the ENFJ to kind of doubt their TI sometimes and want it to be like as perfect as possible because they, it, it's like, so so it's kind of like, like T, TI lower down in the third or fourth slot can cause like a, a, a doubting of your logic. Um, it can cause like a needing to triple check it. And, and because it's like a, not a confidence area. And yes, really well said, Megan. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed listening Thank to you. every second of that. And you're a really awesome person. And uh, I love your content and I love you as a person. <laughs> I mind, but I really wish I could keep talking but thank you guys so much and yeah thank you yeah, Joyce you're for the best type of human oh, thank yeah. you so much all right bye thank you. bye Megan I have to hop <laughs> off too now so bye everyone bye Leanne bye, it was Leanne. good talking <laughs> I, I love good having talk. the chance to see you out. yeah yes have a great night you guys. too and then there were five <laughs> well, plus one, INFJ. <laughs> well, I wanted to just also tag something on what Rivka said about fashion. Um, I realized that <laughs> that I'm going to try and find a way to explain this in a way that's not too nebulous, but there's symbolism behind what everybody wears. Um, and you can even see this like in TV shows. Like there's a reason why they have the jock wearing like all the basketball clothes or whatever, whatever, you know, the sneakers, um, stylish. And then you'll have like the drama or like theater people wearing certain things, the goths wearing certain things, and they all have their own different personalities because this is a reflection of real life. And so even like, like, so I've found myself like noticing stuff like that, like with Jamila, she's really good at ISFP. She's really good at like being able to see something and just know like whether or not like objectively it looks good or it doesn't look good. Um, for me, I have to find, I have to see it on that person. So if you say like, oh, um, like, oh, like if it's on a mannequin, you know, she, which has happened before. She was like, Denzel, do you think that this dress looks good? And I'm like, huh. And I have to think about it. Well, on your sister, yes because it matches her vibe, you know, this is that. But on you, not so much. Like, she'll ask me, like, oh, Denzel, you know, what if I got like a nose stud or whatever? Like, I, I, I would never forbid Jamila from getting whatever she wants, but I just tell her, like, personally, I don't think it fits you. I don't think it fits your personality. And then she jokes around and tells people, like, Denzel won't allow me to get a nose ring. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like, is that like, to me, it's just like, the way that I view people like, you know, with certain things, like with certain tattoos or with all of that, like it's it's a certain vibe that they'll give off. Um, and it's not to say that people who don't give off a certain vibe don't get those tattoos, but I feel like the way that we dress says a lot about us. Um, and so even with like, just literally like earlier today, like I was watching, again, Family Matters, and I brought up like uh, Stefan Urkel, uh, the character from there. He's like Steve Urkel's alter ego, the really cool one or whatever. He has like that Michael Jordan um, hoop ring. And I was talking about like how it's really interesting how there's like, you know, um, the diamond earrings that guys wear. Then there's like the black gauges that guys wear. And then they have the hoop earrings. And all of these are like different for a reason. And the diamond earrings would be the least likely one that I would get because even though I think they look nice, it's not 
me. It it doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you an accurate portrayal of me. Um, same thing with, you know, like, but like the hoop earring, like, you know, I could see that. Um, and then even like one year for Christmas, like Jamila had dressed me and I had this like really, you know, like my, my shirt was like unbuttoned, like three buttons down and I had a cardigan and then I had this like really studded expensive belt and I was wearing this watch which was just, you know, more than enough. And it just made me look like, I told her like, I look like some geeked out ESTP, like, <laughs> and I, 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 it looked nice, but it just wasn't really like me. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's, that's a lot of, um, at least how I think about fashion. I don't know if Rivka was kind of like pointing to that. Yeah, I completely agree. Like one of, one of the reasons I enjoy this, this practice, I call it, it's, it's a practice of fashion. It's just finding all these like odds and ends that like represent different parts of myself as well and clarifying those. Uh, I guess, yeah, clarity is a really good word to put in here for that completely. It's funny when you talked about like another one of my career paths that I'm looking at is like being a stylist of some sort. And cause I always like watch television shows as so I was like, oh, like this person is wearing this or this color or even just how something is styled. Like, are they rolling up their sleeves? What does that say about the person? And there's, it's so interesting. It's, I'm, I'm really into languages. I speak several of them. And this to me is as legitimate a language as anything that comes out of my mouth. Yeah, even like the tattoos that one might get and like, you know, like I wear this necklace all the time, which is um, Series of Unfortunate Events, um, the VFD eyeball thing. And it's just like to show like, you know, I'm a server um, and people like, you know, every once in a while I'll get another nerd that'll like notice it. Like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, the world is quiet here. And I'm like, oh shoot, like they know like the secret phrase, you know, behind it and everything It's like, but this is telling of who I am, like, you know, cause I'm really geeky. I'm really into um, books like that. And then the TV show series like, you know, came out too. And I'm just really like into like literature and stuff like that. So like that tells a lot about me, but yeah, I was never like, I mean, I have like one button down like right now, but like I was never like the type, like I know like Joel Mark Witt, he buttons it all the way down. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I told you, like, with the chest like, hair. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's cool on him and that's him like that actually fits him so i wouldn't say it looks bad like if i were to do it it i personally would think that it would look bad because it's like me trying to be something that i'm not or it's giving a message that is not me and so i feel like that's something that i really think about a lot of times both for myself and then for other people and that makes me wonder too, like how different types perceive fashion. Like this is like, we're agreeing a lot, but then I think like I go outside and like my hairdresser says that 85% of the people in my city all get like the same like ash blonde bob in the same shape. And they all have like the same Louis Vuitton bag. And they're obviously getting something out of that form of signaling. So I guess it's different for different people. It definitely yeah. is different, I would say. Yeah. Like, people who try to go against that, like, oh, I know that this is going to say this, but why does it have to say that? So they try to take away the coding from it. And I get that too, but it's like, well, labels keep us from drinking Windex instead of Gatorade. So like, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah. I think that, um, okay, before I go, I want to say, I would really like to hear also what Stephanie wanted to say, because I know Stephanie had something to say earlier. Um, I would, yeah, it would be really nice. Um, but just really quickly, um, just going off of what Denzel said, I find it really interesting because like, I don't have that, like when it comes to fashion, like I, I can see things very clearly. I'll, I'll see something. I'm like, oh, this is good for someone, you know, and I'll just buy it for that person or whatever it is. But I think what I want to say about fashion, which might be kind of interesting for you guys is that. Um, I lived in Japan for several years. I'm not Japanese, but I lived in Japan um, recently. And um, the thing about Japanese culture, I don't know if you guys know, is that like, it's about the collective, right? It's about the, the whole uh, in, in the culture. So you don't really want to deviate too far from that. So what I found, my, found myself doing, and I travel a lot, um, and I always thought that this was maybe an ENFJ thing, but like, I always try to blend in, you know, I don't like to call attention to myself. 
So if I'm in Japan and I do not, I'm telling you, I tell my friends this all the time and I, they think it's so funny, but there's these like pants that almost every Japanese person has, like women. And, um, and it's like this really, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like really loose fitting. Um, you just don't wear that in the States. Like no one wears it, right? But then when I'm in Japan and everyone's wearing it, I'm like, I need to conform. So I start wearing the same clothes. So when I'm in Japan, even though I'm actually Chinese ethnically, and with Asian culture, you can, you can tell more easily, like with our features. But um, usually people would, you know, with anyone else, like you could tell, like I'm not Japanese, but because I'm conforming so well, I'm wearing the clothes, I have my bangs, <laughs> not right now, but I have my bangs that everyone has. Like I, I just blend in. Everyone just thinks I'm Japanese there. So I, I kind of feel like that goes with ENFJ and how I think it's more about yeah. like these social norms and these social constructs that I don't want to. Yeah, I think, them. yeah. I guess both ways can be true depending where the ENFJ grew up. Like if you if an ENFJ grew up in the US um, with a highly individualistic culture um, in a group that cared about that, they would dress more in an individualistic way. But if they grew up in a collectivist culture, they would they would adopt that social norm from that area and, and dress in that area's type of style. And so I think that's why the ENFJs can vary so widely. And so to piggyback off of Denzel's point about like how he wants the people that he's close to to just like be themselves when they dress a certain way. Um, so like the reason why like, like e my ENFJ like she tries to meet my needs is like she doesn't want me to become someone who I'm not too. Like she wants to be able to accommodate to who I am. She doesn't want me to change to conform to her. And she's like, just be yourself. Like, like don't feel the need or pressure to to be someone you're not because you want to like conform to me. Like so she she makes this safe atmosphere for me to feel okay with like like ENFJs are good with generating psychological safety with those that they, they care about. Like for, for example, I'll give you guys an example. With with eating food outside, what what she'll do is she'll like she'll try to consider my budget. She'll go like, okay, Joyce, be honest, tell me your budget. And it's because like she doesn't wanna she doesn't wanna do something that will make me uncomfortable. And like she's always looking at my comfortability. And and so I feel like back to the fashion, like I guess e ENFJs might accept people's fashions around them because they want the people around them to be comfortable. And so that plays a part too. Also, Rebecca, you had something you wanted to say, so I'll pass the mic to you. <laughs> yes, thank you. And then I also want Stephanie to be able to speak. I feel bad. Um, but it's funny what Vicky said because it's pretty much along the same lines as what I was going to say that um, I noticed growing up I tried very much to just wear what other people wore. So jeans and a shirt and nothing too crazy. But then as I've come into my own, and I guess this is the T-I-F-I -I part, I realized, well, what really expresses me? And like Denzel said, I've got my Spider-Man watch. It's like my geeky stuff that I normally would hide away. And um, I'm trying to wear darker clothes to embrace that gothic in my inner goth and it feels weird like i'm not wearing it now but it, because it's like well i gotta mm -hmm. fit in and so i still find myself doing that where it's like if i could dress however i want it would probably surprise the heck out of everybody because i would look so different um but i don't want to make people feel uncomfortable and i don't want them to get a wrong impression of who i am so i end up trying to wear more sunny bubblier colors just but I'm trying to get away from that and realize, well, who who am I? And I should embrace that. And, but yeah. it's hard. It's mm -hmm. really hard. At least for me, I find it's hard to really go yeah. all the way. <laughs> totally. Yeah. FE looks around it to see what's socially acceptable and then tries to adopt that. And the growth journey is like integrating more of their individuality and like figuring out what that is to, to them. And so, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll comment on the fashion thing before my previous thought. Um, I, I relate more so to what Vicky and, and I guess what Rebecca were saying too. Like I've, I've always been more, not, not blending in the fashion, just very neutral. Like I don't like, um, I don't like 
things that draw too much attention to myself unless mm -hmm. it's like for a very specific event like I'm going to a festival or something like that um I did have some phases when I was younger where I was experimenting but it was also because I was living abroad and I was trying to fit in I was living in France for a little while and I was trying to fit in and experiment with like what I liked and what fit in with the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and now I, mm -hmm. I'm still, I still sort of dress the same, but my, <laughs> like this, this necklace and this ring are geeky things. Like this, this is a, a biometric thing. It measures my sleep and this is like an EMF protection thing. So it's like, it's not being fashionable. It's like, it actually speaks a lot about <laughs> who I am and what I'm interested in. But, um, yeah it's it's definitely different but I, I think i can look at something and tell whether it would look good on me or on someone else or or if it would fit me or not um and then what i was going to say before going back to uh looping back around to the social justice and the strengths of the enfj um i think I don't know if this is specific just to me, so it'd be interesting to hear from, from the rest of you guys, but influencing and inspiring people, um, whether it's directly, but for me personally, it's more like in an indirect way. I, I don't know if I would consider it planting seeds necessarily, but, but just kind of, uh, I think Megan was talking about being the change you wish to see. And I'm not by any means perfect, but I, there are things that I believe very strongly in that, that I want to see the world progress towards, that I live out in my daily life, that I don't preach about to other people. I just live it out. And if people come to me and ask me about them, then I'm 150% happy to share and and explain or whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever information they want from me, I'll share it. Um, but I was commenting, um, talking about this to Denzel some phone calls ago, uh, that recently I've been sharing a little bit more of my like, not so much beliefs, but like, I guess ideas and like and kind of backing it up with science and things that I that I'm into that I wouldn't normally pre talk about unless someone saw me doing it and approached me about it. But I've been sharing things on social media and I've been seeing um, how it's affecting people and how people are reaching out to me and and having really positive um, benefits and results from it and also like fostering intimacy between myself and the other person which is something that i really crave as a sexual five um and and this is also happening outside of social media uh, just maybe at a slower rate but but yeah influencing people like almost on very or inspiring them i don't know on very subtle levels for myself i don't know if you, do you guys find that that happens for you in a more direct way or indirect way? Yeah, it it definitely happens. Sorry, it's it's. I'm saying one thing, but I actually want to be. I'm gonna get this out of my system first. I'm <laughs> and tie that tie the two things together. Uh, I wanted to like tie in the fashion thing uh, first because it's really interesting to see like these different perspectives. And for me, I feel like I actually see both of them. Uh, so I live in Calgary in Canada and. I actually like, it's funny, I don't wear probably like 80% of my wardrobe uh, because like this is such a conservative city at the end of the day. Uh, so like there, there definitely is kind of that consideration for it. And it's also been kind of a journey to be like, well, how much do I like lean into that? And how much do I lean into this instead? Uh, and then um, it's my, my fashion icon, uh, Iris Apfel, uh, she's like this, I guess she's 98 or something now. She lives in New York. She just dresses crazy. And she says her style is either Zen or Baroque. And I, I really, re I relate to that as well. It's funny. I have a, I have a strong Zen practice and meditation practice. Uh, and in that, like you just dress like in, I do Zen Buddhism. You just dress in like dark clothing and you like look down and it's like kind of the opposite of what I'm doing here. 
And there, to kind of tie it into the next thing that you said, Stephanie, uh, in Zen Buddhism, we talk about how like we don't, I can't, can't I've only seen this word in writing, pros, pros, Denzel, help me out here, proselytize? Yes, we don't proselytize. Yeah, yeah, we just kind of live out, we live out our values and stuff. And if, if people are kind of interested in what we do, then totally we'll, we'll encourage people to get involved but it's not something that like I would like knock on people's doors to tell them and that's kind of how I've been trying to live out my life as well uh and I think I'm really surprised again I mentioned I have really low self-esteem so I think I'm surprised a lot of the times like when people find something inspiring in what I do it's it's very often unintentional yeah I actually have in like I found it really interesting because like um well like I also have really low self. I think I'm just really critical of myself. I think this is the ENFJ thing, but like I'm really critical of myself. And but like I think so highly of everyone else. Like they're so much better than me. Um, but I, I wanted to say like one word I always thought like with about us as ENFJs is like we're very pragmatic people. Um, so like I, I guess like because we have like such, such like strong convictions and such strong beliefs. Um, and I also feel the same with Stephanie a lot of times, but sometimes it's like, unless I need to step up, unless like someone's like calling me to step up, I kind of just like let, I don't, I won't say it, right? But people know that about me. And I think um, like, I always feel like I, I live life um, by, I go by like leading by example. So for me, I always feel like if I do it, then and if people see it and it's like, you know, it's good that people might actually do it too. So that's kind of how I see things. So like, like for an example, like I have uh, my staff, um, they know me as like a crazy workaholic. So I work like 15 hours a day, um, like crazy hours. Um, but I think the thing, like for me, what's most important is that I, need to show people that I'm not just giving them work to do, right? Like, cause I don't want to do it. I'm actually doing the work and, um, you know, and I'm doing the stuff that I don't want to do too. And so like other people, I think they get inspired by that. So I remember one time someone told me, and this meant so much to me, but they said, um, you know, I, I said all these plans, like our vision for like, you know, our goals for next year. And they're like, yeah, that's, like we're gonna totally do it because like I really believe in you. I really believe in you as a person and you're gonna be able to drive us. Um, and they get so inspired and that person was telling me like they get so inspired to like work harder because I do. So I really believe in like leading by example. Yeah, it's interesting. Like with ENFJs, what I'm seeing the theme is, is that their action is never really just an action. It has like an underlying thing behind it too. Like with Vicky, she talks about like when she's doing something, there's really the underlying intent of leading by example. And Denzel will say when he's interacting with you, it's never just an interaction. It's planting seeds or like doing something very intentional. So there's always something behind the scenes happening with the ENFJ, some sort of NI philosophy way they conduct life and so you see through the like general fashion trend that they there's a element of social consideration they go around an area and they want to be socially considerate and they also want people to feel as comfortable as they can be so that's also a theme too and very cool everyone and so the next question is what are enfj weaknesses um i guess i can um just kind of, you know, what um, Ophira or Rivka said is that um, I think we have like, I don't know, at least for me, I feel like I have a lot of criticism and critiques about myself. So I do see a lot more of the flaws than I do the positive. Um, so my list of cons is like really long when I was writing all this stuff down to talk about today. And then like my pauses are like this short. <laughs> um, but basically, um, I guess I want to talk about one of the big things for me, just kind of going back to what I, said, I talked about earlier. I, I kind of I kind of see this as a flaw um, when it comes to like, you know, just trying to abide so much by like the, the social norms and co social constructs. So like when I'm in Japan, like it's really hard because I see how things are supposed to be there. Right. And um, 
like there's a lot of things that are like unspoken rules so like you're not supposed to get in the train until everyone comes out or you're not supposed to talk when you're on train or things like that and um you know when i have friends come visit me from anywhere from the u.s especially um uh, we're, we're especially bad uh we're kind of loud <laughs> um so like i i would tell them ahead of time like hey you know when we go on a train please like let's let's, let's try to be a little bit quiet keep our voices down and then our friends, my friends would just be like yelling. <laughs> They're just like talking really loud. And I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, this is so rude. And um, it's really hard for me to like look past those things a lot of times. Like I, I see something, I'm like, oh, this is really wrong. Um, whereas like, it might not need to be construed that way. And I know it. I think that's probably my PI, but like, I kind of, like you know just for me i kind of feel like it's kind of hard for me to like just be like oh that's fine you know so i think that's a that's one of the many yeah it seems like you get upset when people are violating social norms that keep the harmony and it all it's very very interesting vicky w with the feeling like you have a like a long list of cons but a short list of pros i feel like it's a certain form of manifestation of fe so fe is like how you should act and like because the fe user is so aware of like the ways that they could be or should be that they can see all the ways that they're also falling short too and they can be very hard on themselves too and then another thing to say to add on to what you said vicky and so you said you had a short list of pros but i but i will say vicky everyone is charmed by you like so vicky came in to get typed by me and my friend dan burns and when we were done the session like me and dan were messaging each other we were like we really like vicky like she was really cool to type she put me in a good mood just by talking to her and dan was like that was one of my favorite sessions because she's just like a joy to be around so vicky you're very appreciated and yeah <laughs> it was like a privilege to type you <laughs> yeah thank you that's that actually so sweet i'm like i'm, not, I'm like tearing up this is too it's like too sweet <laughs> yeah i just wanna toss in my two cents um mm -hmm. i agree with joyce like i mean i haven't known vicky long but she gives off a very warm energy uh that's and it's like yeah it's it, it i'm pretty sure that it's a heart melter so i don't think i feel like that list that pro list should be a lot longer um but going off of that i i do like joyce had it like spot on like for me i know because i I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. I know that one of my strengths is like, okay, I'm constantly thinking like, how should people be treated? How should we treat people? How should we do emotions, stuff like that? And so when I am, when I do something that I should have known better socially, then I can get very like, are you serious, Denzel? <laughs> you know, but especially if somebody else had to point it out to me. Like if somebody else points out like an FE thing to me, like just for example, like, so like if Vicky were to like point out to me, like, hey, like, you know, around here, everyone on the trains are like quiet. And I didn't even notice for whatever reason, I highly doubt that would happen. <laughs> but but it, somehow it did. And I'm like, oh my goodness, everyone, like I would like really get very, to myself because it's like yo you should have known better than this like when it comes to social gatherings when it comes to people stuff like that like you should have known better like if i if i lose my cool and i like lash out at someone it's like oh, you should have known better <laughs> like they they didn't know better and so you should have been the person to be able to address the situation in this way and all of that and so that's uh, I guess just to, like put it back with what Vicky was saying. Like, I don't know if that would also count as like a weakness, but you know, our weakness could be that when we, when we fail at our strength, then become critical of that. Yeah. It's kind of like the social faux pas. If you accidentally do a social faux pas, you're like 10 times 10 hard on yourself because you really don't want to be that person who is that person who, yeah, mm -hmm, definitely. And so Rivka. 
Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I found out last year that I, uh, I may be an autistic person and that was kind of a, it was a, but it also like, it's, it's a weird struggle with FE cause it's exactly like you said, there's so many shoulds. So when I, I can't do something that I feel like I should be able to do in that sense, it's really, it's like stabbing knives into myself. Uh, lots of shoulds there, Denzel. Uh, which which I, I know because I do this to myself also. Uh, these, these notes are really helpful. Thank you for suggesting this, everyone. Uh, <laughs> everything that everyone else has mentioned, uh, weirdly enough, like this might just be a me thing, but boundaries uh, are difficult to me. I can't remember, Stephanie, it might've yeah. been you who said it. And like having, I remember like in university, especially like I had this friend and I couldn't, see like where she ended and I began and that can lead to a lot of problems there so definitely boundaries self-love and again this might be a me thing but focus and that comes a lot like like we talk about like being in loops and in the grip uh I feel like Joyce we talked at the start how like our, our health is not as good as we'd want it to be right now and I think for me that that is trying to find that at uh, Denzel, you talked about meditating, uh, catching up on my meditation practice and really getting my functions in order. It's a, it's a really vicious cycle with us. Instead of kind of seeing the problem for what it is and just moving forward with it, I'm more inclined to just kind of stay in that like self stabby mess. Even though like, even as I'm saying this, like I'm imagining myself as another person now and I just wanna be like, please don't do this to yourself. You're only making this harder. Yeah, self stabby mess. That's my ENFJ friend. It's like, I find female ENFJs deal with this times 10, but it's like, I can't, like my female ENFJ friend, she's the most charismatic, lovable, charming person. In college, she was like the person that I noticed because I thought she was so cool. She was the only person I noticed and she hates herself. And like, I cannot convince herself out of self stabbing herself and like, I don't know, she reminds me of Vicky a lot. And in the sense that like, I think sometimes ENFJs, like even if you tell them all the things that you love about them, like it'll like bounce off. <laughs> and it's like, cause they're hard on themselves and they won't listen to you, but they're like, oh, it's nice, but they're not internalizing it. Cause at the end of the day, they're gonna choose their self stabby over listening to the good words you have to say to them. <laughs> I just wanted to agree wholeheartedly with that. I thought it was just me struggling with self-esteem and self-flagellation, like constantly, I'm the worst. And it's been such a journey of trying to figure out who am I with the boundaries and with the FI and the TI, um, trying to separate. I feel like it's been a lifelong process and I'm still figuring that out. But I, what what is that that makes us hate ourselves so deeply but then everyone else it's like they get immunity they're they're perfect and wonderful but to turn that around it's so difficult yeah i feel like it's because when relationships go sour the enfj takes that interpersonal distress on personally so they're like oh this is happening i don't know it's some sort of psychological thing it's like because this person isn't responding the way that my effie expected it to because this effie caught like FE has a certain understanding of cause and effect. TE is known for cause and effect thinking, but I think FE also has it. And it's like, so if I do this action correctly, then someone should respond positively, but the other party doesn't respond positively. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm a part of this equation, this cause and effect. So I'm, I'm the reason that this person isn't responding positively. And then I'll have, I'll try to convince my ENFJ off of it. Like, no, like it's that person. And she's like, but she, it's almost like she's she takes responsibility for the relationship working. It's like over, over personalizing the relationship. And yeah. I know that Antonia always says that it's definitely inferior TI. Like inferior yeah. TI is prone to self-attacking, whereas tertiary TI is like prone to attacking others. Not to say that ENFJ is aren't prone to attacking other people and INFJs are not prone to attacking themselves, but it's more common to lash in at ourselves with inferior TI apparently. Um, and so, yeah, she and, and Antonia, like, I think it is a lot more common with ENFJ females for sure, because 
although I do relate to like an extent, it's not nearly as much as I've seen with the other ENFJs, yeah. like in our mm-hmm. uh, training class and everything. It's yeah. Just, oh yeah, that's wow. Like I feel for it, but um, yeah, it's the inferior TI, like really, like Antonia calls it the inner mean girl. Um, and a lot of people like related to that. Yeah, it's true. I think what the TI, it, what the inferior TI is doing. So the, the the dominant FE notices that there's interpersonal distress or like something going wrong out externally. And what the TI does in inferior slot, it, it rationalizes what's happening. And so it goes like, oh, so this is happening. And then it'll jump to because of me. Because you know the ENFJ feels re- responsible for the world, and then, and then it's like, no, nope, that's an incorrect TI conclusion. That was oversimplifying logic to hurt yourself. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a good one, Joyce. Yeah, because it's it's kind of like what I said. Like you know better. Like, like if there's a if there's an argument, um, in my family, granted, my father's an ENFJ too, but like, and we don't we don't have arguments in our family. But if there was, then I would be like, dang, this is my fault because I'm the one who knows better. It's like this God complex, Mm -hmm. at least for me, that's like, I know relationships. (laughs) I should have known better. Like if I had done my part, if I had done my job, then this fight would not have happened. And so if I had just spoken up, if I had just done this, if I had just done that, um, so yeah, I think that you're really spot on with that. And then another thing I was going to say, like, so with weaknesses, my things I would say is that like, it all goes to inferior TI once again. So one big thing is I feel like, and y'all can let me know if y'all resonate or not, but like ENFJs are some of the kings and queens of that stereotypical thing in the show where it's like, I was just trying to protect you. <laughs> like, because it's like the TI like keeps certain information from like, like we don't tell people certain information because we're afraid that it might hurt them or it might ruin the vibes or the connection. And so you 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 restrain information um, so that you can value the FE and keep the harmony and the connection there. But once we start to integrate the TI better, then we start to learn how to deliver um, hurtful news or, you know, bad news or whatever in a more tactful way, that'll still be like receptive. It still might hurt, but our delivery won't hurt. And so therefore we can, and then we can fix it from there and that'll create like true harmony. So that's like one thing. And then the last thing I would also say is again, with inferior TI, a lot of times because we're so, uh, like inferior TI is like, like, and TI itself is what makes sense to you as an individual. Forget about what the collective thinks, forget about this, forget about that. Like, what do you think? And a lot of ENFJs, um, if they haven't worked on that TI, then they tend to just go along with what the collective thinks about a lot of things. Like, okay, this is the social thing. And that's why a lot of times they can be called like conformists because it's like, oh yeah, we just all agree on this. Like, all right, then that's what we're going to do, you know? Um, but once they start really getting into that TI and it's like, wait a minute, no, like this is actually what I think, or a lot of them could know what they think, but they don't share it because, you know, they're afraid of like, you know, well, if I speak my TI thoughts, it's going to again, ruin the vibes or it's going to like, you know, make me a public enemy <laughs> in which the TPs, they all have become at times because they're always sharing their TI thoughts. Um, but once again, when we find like when we find a way to marry that FE and that TI, because even though they're two sides of a coin, they're still connected. They're still polarities. So instead of like the popular opinion where like FE and TI are always opposing each other, I really believe they can find a way to integrate it. So where like you can share your TI and it's going to work perfectly in line with your FE. Yeah. Um, and that way, it won't be hurting feelings again with the way that you're delivering it. But instead, people can see that you're just trying to like solve an issue. So I can be direct, like, and tell Stephanie, like, Stephanie's like literally like my <laughs> one of my best friends of all time. But like, I can tell her, like, you know, like, yo, in our friendship, like, you do this and you do that, and like, that's not cool. Like, it, it makes me feel this way, and that could ruin the vibes right there. But then she could be like receptive. 
and she and then now we can fix it and then we'll have an even better you know relationship from there but if i just keep on like hiding it because i'm afraid of that moment where it's going to drop before we pick it back up even higher then that's another problem one exercise i've been doing to kind of build myself up uh, not even through my own volition, I have to have a friend to push me into doing this, is uh, exactly what you said, like being direct in situations where I know it's gonna mess the social vibe a bit. And it like, it physically hurts. I can feel like we talk about like bodily sensations. I'll get overwhelmed. I don't quite have the distress tolerance skills to bring myself down. I might start like physically shaking because I'm so nervous. And that's, it's good to do that in low risk situations. Uh, I think going back to the strengths, um, something Denzel, you said at the end, kind of like the vibe goes down, but then it goes back up again. And I think like at our best, we have a gift of being able to bring the whole group through that emotional experience out to the other side. Yeah, I, I guess for me, it's a little bit hard to, because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is like, I think we have such, such strong like conviction so I have to juggle with that a lot. You know, it's like, I want the harmony, but at the same time, I feel this responsibility. Like if something happens and like other people aren't speaking up, but they come to me and they're like, oh, you know, these things and like, I'm feeling this way. And I'm like, and this is the thing about ENFJ too. We try to solve everyone's problems. So I'm like, yeah. oh no, I was like, okay, like, let me go and do the thing that they don't want to do even though i personally don't want to do it too and like maybe it's like confronting people or you know just whatever it is it's like it's just like how you said um ophira is that you know like i start shaking like i get so like nervous because like i i really don't want to do it um you know i i want everyone to to <laughs> to every everyone to like just be happy and like everything's good but then at the same time then then we're not growing as people and that's really hard for me to like just live with <laughs> yes that is a really good point vicky about how like enfjs do care about like the social vibes but what is i think ultimately most important to them is if the environment is conducive to growth and if it's not like you have to act and you have to make sure that it is in a better direction because overall you are big picture people if the big picture is kind of like sullied you want to like fix it and you're like this has to be in a better better trajectory and um, and so stephanie any opinions on enfj weaknesses uh i agree with what everyone said about being self-critical and 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 it really it really stemming from disappointments in relationships or in how i've managed something within a relationship um and I'm I'm a head teacher, so I have to supervise a bunch of TAs and and other teachers, and I found it really difficult. It's it's been an area of growth for me for sure to have to push myself to be upfront with people, especially when they're not doing what's expected of them. Um, I've <laughs> it's been really hard, um, but over the last year, I'd say of having to practice that a lot I've gotten a little bit better and just kind of like um, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable I suppose and it's gotten a little bit better but um, another weakness kind of um, drawing away from FETI I was gonna say uh, uh, and I guess this ties into everyone writing things down but bad memory um, just forgetting things, which is why I also have to write things down. Um, sometimes I, I have this internal battle uh, between my FE and like, I don't know what the other thing, what, what the other cognitive function would be, but like, I, I don't want to interrupt the person, but I have a thought and, and I don't know, I can't pin it uh, in my mind or I might try to, but I'll lose it. Um, so similar to what's been happening with a few of you where you lose your train of thought and then you can't get it back. Um, yeah, and, and I've even had, I don't know, this might just be me or like lack of sleep, but I, I've had many moments where I don't know if something was a dream, was a memory, or if like I just had a random thought and it actually didn't happen. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, I feel, I feel like it's a weakness because I feel like it affects my performance or like questioning if I did something or if I said something. So I'm always second guessing myself a lot of times, especially like if I told someone to do something or not. But yeah, I don't know how you guys relate to that. My dad says I have the best memory in the world for things that never happened. Yeah, I actually think um, this goes to, I think this is my main um, criticism of myself. And um, but like, I mean, I have many, but like this is one of the main ones is that I, I think it goes along with what you said, Stephanie. I think it has to do with us always looking into the future, right? And I remember um, listening to the Personality Hacker podcast about how we have like monkey mind. And I totally agreed with it because I'm always, I, there's something that like, I wish I could be better at, but I wish I was more in the present, which I'm not. I'm on my mind is always thinking about something in the future. I'm always planning. I'm always thinking about how things could be better or whatever it is. So I, I feel like that is why we can't maybe, or at least for me, I feel like that's why, like I, you know, I forget things or it's maybe just these details aren't important to me because the future and like the growth is more important. Um, so I told this to Joyce on our call before too, how like one thing that people say to me a lot is like, especially when I'm being so self-critical of myself, um, people will say like, wait, you've done all of these things and they'll start naming them. And it's so funny because I, don't even think about them. Like, I don't remember them. Like, I mean, I, I know I've done those things, but I, it doesn't matter to me because that's in the past. So I don't give myself that time to really think about my accomplishments. I only think about like what I could have done better and what I could do better moving forward. So sorry, one last thing is about the, um, when I was listening to your podcast, Joyce, um, I love your podcast. <laughs> and I've told you this before. I mean, not your podcast, your, your YouTube channel, but like, um, just like when I was listening in on one of the INTJs, um, they said that like, I think it's because we're so similar, which is like, we think so much about the future um, and like, you know, planning and all of that stuff uh, that like, I, at least for me, I don't feel like I'm a very spontaneous person and I can't really be. And the only way for me to be spontaneous is if I plan in a period of time to be spontaneous. I'll be like, okay, these three hours, I am super fun and spontaneous. And like, we can do whatever. Like, just tell me what we're gonna do at that time. But it's planned. Yeah, I, I relate to the concept of planned spontaneity too. <laughs> yeah, it's like I have to mentally prepare myself to be spontaneous, but I can do it when I've mentally prepared myself. <laughs> Just real quick, what is Vicky's Enneagram and do we know? I, I think um Joyce, you're saying I'm a three two. Yeah, three wing two. Okay. Yeah. That was a great point. How you're always in the future and that you're and that causes you to not appreciate anything you've done in the past. And my my ENFJ has the same problem, which is why no matter what accomplishment I tell her that she's done, her TI doesn't take it because any past information is irrelevant because she is so focused on the future. <laughs> and so my last question for tonight is, are there any famous ENFJs that you know about or any fictional real life ENFJs that you've typed? I was going to say something about Denzel um, because I did watch like I've watched a lot of Joyce's videos, so you're in one of them and you're talking about, um, this is, this is relates to it, but uh, basically uh, the person I'm thinking about, I always relate it a lot to Obama just because like, I remember before I knew about typ typology, before I even knew I'm a, I was an ENFJ, I remember I would watch his speeches and before during his primaries, I was like, he is so good because I think it's, I think it's because he has such strong convictions and he knows what he wants, right? When we're confident about like what we what we know and what we want, um, I think we can speak with such conviction. But then later, like I love, I mean, I still love Obama, but like later I remember watching some of his speeches and he's kind of known for his like, uh, you know, and like he's known for that. And um, it kind of, it reminds me of what you said, Zinzel, which is, um, and I related so much with it, which is like, <laughs> my family and my friends laugh at me all the time because I, you, you know, tend to go on too much. You, you talk about giving too much context. And I, I tend to like, just go on a lot about like, and then this is why um, 
you know, I feel like I get self-conscious too. Like, this is why people can't, like, I can't tell. I think people might see me as like, I'm not sharing information, but it's because I'm per like, I, I'm intentionally holding back information because I'm like, I'm giving way too much, right? I'm like, I didn't need to tell them that like about five years ago, but then I'm thinking about it in my head and I'm like, what should I cut out? And um, yeah, so I was gonna say, I relate a lot to you, Zazan, I relate a lot to Obama in that <laughs> Could that be like inferior TI too? In the sense that like, I don't know what to TI like take out of this or like maybe, and then it's like, oh no, I kept too much of it. <laughs> I don't know, just a yeah. thought. I guess like maybe it's also because like, um, at least like for me, I feel like I don't, I'm, I struggle with it because I don't want to like, misinformation like give them not enough information so that they understand but at the same time i feel like oh i'm burdening them it's way too much information i'm picking up all their time so i just struggle with that all the time yeah weighing yeah. what's socially appropriate yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i feel that it's like knowing um how much to give so that it's like okay i don't want to treat you as if you're stupid but I don't think that you're stupid. I just think that I'm not probably doing a good enough job on explaining. So I'm gonna try to over explain it just so that I can make sure that we're on the same page. Cause I'd rather you, I'd rather make a hundred percent sure that you understand than just kind of like, like TJs who are always just saying like, oh, just say less. It's like, when I say less, people don't get it. And then we have miscommunications. <laughs> so I'm gonna just say more so that I know that you get it. And if you still didn't get it at the end of the day or if something came out of this, like that was just bad. And now I know like most of the time I know like it's not my fault. Like, you know, I was like, no, I explained this <laughs> thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, one more thought about Obama. I just remembered this is, um, but basically um, the reason why I brought Obama as well is because um, I think it relates so much to like ENFJs and just wanting harmony. I really, when I'm watching him, I see him struggling and I'm like, Oh no, it's because he's trying to, um, he, he's trying to like, you know, there's like so many constitu constituents and they all want something different. So in his head, he's probably thinking like, oh, what does this person want? What does that person want? And if he's like, doesn't know how to say it so that it's like polit politically correct. So that's how I see it when I'm watching him and I'm like, oh no, like I feel bad for him and I'm like sweating for him. That is such an FE struggle. <laughs> yeah. And so Denzel, you typed J. Cole as an ENFJ, right? Yeah, I I think that he he's not only my favorite rap artist, but he's also like, um, he's just an awesome guy altogether in my opinion. Like I've watched so many interviews. I've listened to the evolution of his music from back in the day up till now. Um, I even made like a video in depth um, on me breaking down his type and why I believe that he's an ENFJ, putting in a whole bunch of like interviews of him growing up um, and putting like captions to explain this is where and I is being uh, seen and like compare this to back when he was 24 and you know, he was very F-E-S-E -E oriented and stuff like that. Um, so I think that, yeah, I heavily relate to him. In fact, my theme song on my channel um, is actually from one of his songs, I'm a Dollar in a Dream 3. Um, so yeah, I really relate to him as a person, uh, as an ENFJ, um, although I believe that he's an um, Enneagram 3, uh, self-preservation social maybe, or I don't I don't really know the, uh, the yeah, I don't really know 100%, but I, I do believe that he's an ENFJ 3. Um, but for fictional ones, I always really liked Raymond Reddington from The Blacklist. That's my favorite show of like all time. Um, it's such a good show in my opinion. And I think that if anyone ever wants to see F.E. and I at its highest form, that show like really show, like showcases it. Like he's a very jovial, funny guy. He's a self-preservation seven. So he's like, extra funny in that sense and like he's trying to like you know but like he he does things so strategically like seeing that that um social strategy of like wit and planting seeds and setting up dominoes so that you know people can like 
like so that he can like foretell the future in a way. Um, I, I really like relate to that, like how he goes about everything. Um, and I also heavily relate to Professor Xavier from the X-Men, um, not the TV show. I believe that the TV show X-Men is um, INFJ, Professor Xavier. But I believe that in the movies, um, like Apocalypse and um, the most recent one, Dark Phoenix and all of that, I believe that that Professor Xavier is an ENFJ. And coincidentally, Jean Grey is INFJ um, in the movies, but she's ENFJ in the show. I don't know if she's actually an ENFJ or if I'm just like kind of fangirling and projecting what I want to see on her. Uh, I mentioned Iris Apfel, uh, my fashion icon. Uh, I watched a, a documentary about her and I heard, for example, like she's such a unique person, but like she's worked for the White House, like through several administrations, for example. And that to me, like just is a testament to her ability to work with a wide variety of people and kind of see where they're coming from and just kind of the way she addresses a crowd and sees and the way she analyzes clothing. There's something very familiar about that. Uh, Denzel, you wrote something a while back about how you're very critical towards NFJs, uh, both in fiction and real life. And I noticed that with myself sometimes too, like Joyce, our, our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, I think Susan Storm typed him as an ENFJ. And I saw that and I was like, I don't like, <laughs> I have it out for our prime minister. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe too, it's because like, I, I wonder why that is maybe like, because there are the similar cognitive functions and like we, we talk about shoulds and expectations and convictions. And so we kind of see our like less good qualities than someone else sometimes and it's easier to cringe that way. Uh, in terms of fictional character, uh, I'm a big Avatar The Last Airbender fan. I used to like, it's funny, I wanted to be at Azula, but I had, Denzel, I talked to you about that. And then I talked to my INTJ friend. She's like, no, you just admire her. Like, you're actually a Katara. And I was like, damn it, you're, you're right. <laughs> Vicky, I think you said, like, I don't want this to get lost because it was so smart. You said um, one of our, our, I guess, strengths and weaknesses is our conviction. And I really relate to that quality and that character and how she carries it through. I just wanted to quickly throw in that I actually think that both Katara and Azula could be ENFJ. Um, so that's that's an interesting combination there. And even there's some suspicion, I'm not confident on this. I'm confident that Mufasa from Lion King is ENFJ, but there's also a little bit of suspicion that Scar might also be an ENFJ, which is also, you know, that'd be interesting too, like that, like, cause we're not used to ENFJ villains, um, but that strategy, which in the blacklist, like Raymond Reddington, he's kind of like an anti-villain cause he's a, he's a criminal that was on the most wanted list for over 30 years, they couldn't catch him. And finally he turns himself in and then he takes over the FBI. And it's like, what the heck? And he's building his empire from that. Yeah, so Azula, you could be both. You could be both Azula and Katara in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I to I'm sorry, I'm totally geeking out, but like, I totally agree. And like, I, I think that's the thing that's so funny. Like, as well, like, it, we could totally be those people just because there's, they both have such strong beliefs. And like, if we're going to talk about like nerdy things, um, I'm also just thinking about Game of Thrones. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I kind of always felt like Marjorie Tyrell. Um, yeah, but, because, yeah, and I know the whole like, show. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's funny because like, like a lot of people are like, no, that's not it. But I'm like, I can totally see her motives. And I totally see like, she just really believes in, you know, all of these things. So sorry, I'm nerdy. I'm nerding out right now. It's interesting to me that Denzel said there aren't many ENFJ villains because I started noticing in Disney movies, the female villains, aren't they often ENFJs? Like Maleficent and, but maybe not. Ursula. Ursula. Yeah, I, I only I only think of Ursula and Maleficent. I do believe that she's an ENFJ, technically, but her care. It's like it's one of those interesting things where it's like. So if I was to professionally type her, I would like look at her childhood, and then it's like, okay, yeah, you are an ENFJ, and then some stuff happened, and now you you operate in this way. But her character is more fitting with INTJ. And so it's it's like it's one of those things where it's like you know she's not a real person so you can't really like put it but I would say like 
she seems more of like an INTJ, even though like looking at her background story and everything, then you could be like, oh no, but she was an ENFJ that turned into whatever that she is, even though type, you can't change types, but I don't know if that makes sense. And of course it's just my opinion, but yeah. 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 Yeah, I just find that interesting because I was, at least to me, I thought Disney was sort of doing an ENF, ENFJ, INFP sort of princess queen dynamic, but it could be me overanalyzing it <laughs> or not analyzing it correctly. Um, so I guess I could jump in with the ones that I have. And again, I'm not an MBTI expert, uh, so these might not be right. Uh, but I know Jennifer Lawrence is often typed as ENFJ but sometimes ENFP, she's ENFP. <laughs> I get told I'm an ENFP all the time. I'm like, I don't know. Um, so I vibe with ENFPs really well. I don't know what that is. So sorry, wrong one. And how about this? Let me try my fictional. What about Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec? Is she an ENFJ? Yes, FJ. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, then I don't have, well, well Oprah, Oprah. Oprah is definitely ENFJ. I love Oprah, but I didn't want to take her. I felt like that was the low-hanging fruit that everyone knows Oprah is an ENFJ. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a quintessential ENFJ, too. Yeah. It's like almost an unfair archetype to hold ourselves against. Right. Yeah, I'd say... She's like the most ENFJ, ENFJ. No one mistypes Oprah. Oprah is always ENFJ in every system. Except for herself. She typed herself as an introvert. And the way that she said it was... You know what we have in common? You're an introvert. I'm an introvert. And I was like, that is <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm more introverted than she is. <laughs> but but yeah, I, I would say also um uh Maya Angelo, she's a great example of an ENFJ in my opinion. Aslan, I believe that he's a great example of an ENFJ from um Chronicles of Narnia. Um Alicia Keys, and uh there was one other person. I can't really recall right now. It was a woman, but yeah. Oh, Wonder Woman. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, Wonder Woman. I believe that in the recent movies, um, she's also an ENFJ. Um, but real quick, I remember what I was going to say, just last thing with Rivka. Heidi introduced me to Justin Trudeau um, when me and her first met. Not not like in person, but like... <laughs> But like, I know some like pretty high up there people. <laughs> right. But like she she had uh, wrote an, an article about uh, types in Canada or something like that. And then she had put Justin Trudeau and I was like, oh. And so I got excited. And me and Heidi's first video where we we're talking about like properly profiling people. Then I brought up like how I'm just the type of person that I always look up all these fictional and real life ENFJ people. Like, like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr. or whatever. So I can learn from them. Justin Baldoni, I believe that he's another great ENFJ, and his character in um, uh, uh, Jane the Virgin is also an ENFJ. Um, so I just keep on throwing these out. I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, I believe like when I would like when back then I looked up Justin Trudeau and I was like, trying to like, learn from him or whatever. And now knowing what I know, it's like. Ugh. <laughs> he's a disgrace to our type. <laughs> and it's like, how can I, like, you know, I, I still claim him just like I also claim Jim Jones and Ted Bundy. Um, I won't deny that they are also ENFJ, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, when you, when I see these poor examples, I'm like, oh, like, yeah, I, I it, it just hurts. <laughs> I feel so unaware of Canadian politics now. I'm like, why do you guys hate him so much? I'm I'm missing out on something. You guys gonna need to tell me later. But um, interesting, interesting examples, guys. And, and so during my typing session with Vicky, my friend Dan thought that Vicky reminded him of Meghan Markle. I know her type is debated, but generally the consensus is ENFJ. And and so I thought I'd also pitch that in too. And an I have Sarah from Firefly slash Serenity. I think that she reminds me of Stephanie too. <laughs> I, I have a, a funny example of Oprah. Like, I don't know, it's funny to me, but um, I remember I was listening in on Reese Witherspoon talking, I think it was Reese Witherspoon talking about Oprah when she met her. 
Um, and then someone on Oprah's staff t told Reese Witherspoon, like, do not chew gum, right? And then Reese was like, why? Like, I, I like chewing gum. And then um, I guess that is Oprah's thing. She just does not like anyone. She's like disgusted by it. So she does not like anyone to chew gum around her. And I, I thought that was really ENFJ because I'm kind of particular in some things too. Like I, I get like, I don't know, like OCD about certain things or, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, I could, I could totally see myself telling people not to chew gum or, you know, eat, you know, chew their mouth full or, <laughs> yeah. Super interesting. And so Stephanie? I can't think of any off the top of my head besides Oprah, but there's someone that I follow on Instagram that's clearly to me an ENFJ and I relate to her a lot. Um, her name is Sophia Rowe and she's just mostly a chef. She does a bunch of things, but I can really see her super hardcore FE and, and like her desire to create change in the world and inspire. And she's, She's been doing these talks lately about different social justice issues and she connects so many things together. Um, and she's she's constantly like reminding people in a really kind but like stern way to think about others and to to do the right thing and and to do things for one's community, which is really important to me. Um, and and again, tying all of these different interests uh, or themes and social justice issues together. Um, she's also very, like she has this um, educator undertone as well, where she's trying to like create a community, but teach them. And that's really, that really speaks to me because it's something that I aspire to. And, and as a teacher, like I, I'm doing that anyway. Um, so her and I can see I can see her TI coming out and and some like self critical posts she she does and and like her SE she really enjoys being out in nature and like she's a really good example of a a very self aware and healthy ENFJ to me and like a really down to earth great examples everyone and so thank you ENFJs for coming out you guys are very like world changers. You guys really set a legacy for the world to follow. You guys are responsible citizens. You guys are so socially considerate. You ENFJs are so smooth with maneuvering yourselves around social situations. You guys bring a certain warmth to every interaction you guys go into. You guys are wells of consideration and you guys give and give and give. And you guys really, really f like make people feel comfortable, loved, supported, cared about. And you really make the people who you care about known that, they, that you care about them through your actions, your dedication, your consistency and I really, really appreciate you ENFJs in my life. You really add to my happiness because you guys are just like, you You guys are not afraid to go to like, I don't know, you guys hold so much emotional space for me and to feel comfortable and fully me. Like, I don't feel forced to be anything around you guys. You guys are so, 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 like fun to be around and literally INFJs and ENFJs are like my favorite duo like we, they make great friends and it was awesome like to know you all and you guys when I enter the room you you instantly hit me with good vibes like I have good vibes for for days now <laughs> because you know ENFJ overload and so thank you for just bombarding everyone with your social consideration and your good vibes they really they really brighten up people's days i appreciate enfjs and all you do for the world your kindness sets a legacy for the generations to come and you guys really like to leave a long lasting impact impact on those that love you and so thank you for leaving a long lasting impact on your loved ones and on people and thank you everyone for watching. You are awesome. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>